module C, non-parametric and semi-parametric multiple testing procedures, part 1. We will begin this module with a discussion of one of the fundamental principles of multiple testing and we'll then move on to a more practical discussion of commonly used non-parametric and semi-parametric procedures and we'll take a closer look at their properties. Beginning with section C1, I will introduce two basic procedures. The Bonferroni, which is a simple single step procedure and the SIMES, which is a global test. I will explain that it can only be used for testing the global null hypothesis of no effect. After that, in section C2, we will take a look at the closure principle. This principle was formulated back in the 70s and has since provided a mathematical foundation for a, a very broad class of stepwise multiple testing procedures. In fact, all procedures we're going to discuss in this course are based on this important principle. And this will then set the stage for a detailed review of stepwise non-parametric and semi-parametric procedures. The first family of stepwise procedures we're going to introduce in section 3 is the family of multiple testing procedures with a data-driven testing sequence, or in other words, data-driven hypothesis ordering. We will concentrate on multiplicity problems that arise in clinical trials where there is no natural way to arrange the null hypotheses. And therefore, testing algorithms we're going to discuss will rely on a data-driven testing sequence. The Holm, the Hommel, the Hobgur procedures that you see at the bottom of the slide, they're all examples of multiple testing procedures with a data-driven testing sequence. We will discuss them in this module, module C, and then in the next module, module D, we will take a look at another class of stepwise procedures. Those will be procedures used in multiplicity problems with a fixed or pre-specified testing sequence. Section C1, basic multiple testing procedures. Let us begin with uh, setting the stage for popular non-parametric and semi-parametric procedures. And these are, by the way, multiple testing procedures that are widely used in clinical trial applications. We will define the Bonferroni and SIMES procedures. And an important reminder for us here is that the Bonferroni and SIMES procedures will be introduced not necessarily because they are useful by themselves, but mostly because they provide a foundation for more efficient, more powerful stepwise multiple testing procedures. The Bonferroni procedure is a non-parametric procedure. It is used in clinical drug development, but it is not very efficient. In fact, it is the least efficient, the most conservative way to perform a multiplicity adjustment. There are plenty of alternatives, and the Bonferroni procedure should be in general considered only as the very last resort. And then when we uh, study the SIMES procedure, I would like to point out that this is a semi-parametric test, but it is not a multiple testing procedure. It is just a test. It cannot be used for examining individual null hypotheses in a given multiplicity problem. It is simply a tool that will be used, and I'll show you how to do it, for building other multiple testing procedures. We are going to take a look first at the Bonferroni procedure, and we will begin with a little bit of history. The Bonferroni procedure is one of the most popular multiplicity adjustments, one of the most popular tools, so to speak, on the multiple comparison market, mainly because it's been around for a very long time. 
The bond frame procedure was most likely proposed by Sir Ronald Fisher. And although the bond frame inequality is named after the Italian mathematician Carlo Emilio Bonferroni, it is important to note that Bonferroni's research actually focused on refining and improving this inequality. And the actual inequality used in the Bonferroni adjustment dates back to the work of the British mathematician George Boole. As we said in Module A, the basic idea behind any multiplicity adjustment is to keep the error rate, the family-wise error rate, at a pre-specified level. For example, at a one-sided alpha of 0.025, and this is accomplished by introducing more restrictive individual significance levels for the individual null hypothesis. The individual tests are no longer carried out at the full alpha. This will lead obviously to error rate inflation, they need to be carried out at a fraction of alpha. And the decision rule of the bond for any procedure is based on simply dividing the overall alpha by the number of tests or the number of null hypotheses in a given multiplicity problem. As you can see on the slide, the bond for an inequality shows that the probability that at least one p-value less than or equal to alpha divided by m, and this probability, by the way, is evaluated under the assumption that all of the null hypotheses are true, this probability is bounded from above by alpha. The key fact used in this inequality is that each p-value follows a uniform distribution on the 0, 1 interval under the global null hypothesis of no effect and therefore the probability that pi is less than or equal to alpha over m is simply equal to alpha over m. Let us now compare, and I think this will be very instructive to do this. Let's compare the decision rule of the bond for any procedure presented on slide 7 with the decision rule of the Symes global test, which is again just a global testing procedure for testing the global null hypothesis of no treatment effect defined here on the slide, H sub i is defined as the intersection of the individual null hypothesis. For example, just to help me illustrate this concept of a global null hypothesis, let us suppose that in a clinical trial with multiple dose placebo comparisons, for example, in the uh, type 2 diabetes clinical trial, which was used in example 4, the global null hypothesis will be associated with the question, is there a drug effect at any dose? And the science procedure can be used to answer this question. But this global test will not tell us which individual dose of this novel treatment is in fact effective. The science test rejects the global null hypothesis if at least one of these conditions is satisfied and there are m different conditions as you can see here at the bottom of the slide and here we use the parenthetical notation that I introduced in module b the p-values that are given at the very bottom the very last line the very bottom of the slide are not the original p-values, these are the ordered p-values. And therefore, the Symes global test rejects the global null hypothesis H sub i if at least one of the following conditions satisfied. The smallest p-value is less than or equal to alpha over m. That's because i is equal to 1. When i is equal to 2, we have this condition. The second ordered p-value is less than or equal to 2 times alpha over m, then the third p-value, the third order p-value, I should say, is less than or equal to 3 times alpha over m, and so on. The very last condition states that the largest of those m p-values is less than or equal to alpha. It is because i is equal to alpha, and then uh, i and m are going to cancel out. So what does this mean? 
How does this compare with the bond for any procedure, which is based on a much more basic decision rule? Well, rejecting the global null hypothesis simply means that there is evidence of a positive effect for at least one null hypothesis, but once again, we may not know which, which that hypothesis is. And in this sense, the bond for any procedure rejects the global null hypothesis if at least one p-value is less than or equal to alpha over m, which is actually the first condition in the Symes method. This immediately implies that the bond for any procedure is based on the first condition in this, on this list, but the Symes test uses all m conditions simultaneously. And as a direct result of that, we conclude that the Symes test is more powerful than the bond for any procedure which means more formally that the Symes test rejects the global null hypothesis whenever the bond for any procedure rejects the global null hypothesis. Uh, we will use the following example, which is based on example 4, the type 2 diabetes trial we introduced in module A to illustrate and compare the bond for any and Symes procedures. The table that you see on this slide, slide 9, defines the raw, the unadjusted p-values for each one of the three dose placebo comparisons in this clinical trial. The p-values are shown in the column on the right. For example, the first p-value for the comparison between dose 1 and placebo is equal to 0.0111. Now, as you go down to the very last row in this table, you will see that the last p-value, which corresponds to the comparison of those three versus placebo, that p-value is equal to 0 0.0293. We will use those p-values as part of the decision rule utilized in the bond for any procedure, but to be able to carry out the science global test, as I explained on slide eight, we will need to define the ordered p-values. Those p-values are shown below the table. For example, the smallest, the smallest p-value is 0 0.0065, and the largest of the ordered p-values is 0 0.0293. This is a list of the ordered p-values, and similarly, we can define the ordered null hypotheses. They simply correspond to the each one of those three ordered p-values. The ordered p-values for the three null hypotheses in example four are plotted in this slide. As before, they are represented by the three orange dots. I would like to point out that the hypotheses on the horizontal axis are once again not the original hypothesis. These are the ordered hypothesis, and that's why I'm using here this parenthetical notation. The hypothesis on the very left corresponds to the smallest p-value, and the hypothesis on the very right corresponds to the largest p-value. And when we now apply the decision rules used in the bond for any procedure and in the Symes global test, we can easily verify that the bond for any procedure only rejects one of those three hypotheses because the associated p-value is less than alpha over 3 and that hypothesis is actually the hypothesis H2 that's what uh, you see I define here at the bottom of the slide but at the same time the Symes global test rejects the global null hypothesis the Symes procedure rejects the global null hypothesis, HI. It can be easily verified if you apply the conditions used in the Symes test. But as I stressed a few minutes ago, the nature of any global test is that we cannot tell. We have no information on the efficacy profiles of the individual doses. We simply know that at least one of them is effective. It is time for us now to go over basic properties of the bond for any procedure and the Symes global test. We're going to begin with the bond for any. This procedure controls the family-wise error rate in any multiplicity problem. 
but it tends to be quite conservative, especially if the number of hypotheses is large or the hypothesis test statistics are strongly positively correlated. Basically, this multiplicity adjustment is more stringent than it needs to be to maintain the family-wise error rate at the desired level. And by contrast, it is not that easy to answer this question for the science procedure. When exactly does the science procedure control the type 1 error rate? And uh, by the way, I'm going to refer to it as the type 1 error rate because the SIMS global test once again tests a single hypothesis. It's the global null hypothesis rather than multiple individual hypotheses. The SIMS test controls the type 1 error rate for certain joint distributions. For example, when the hypothesis test statistics are known to be independent or they are positively correlated, and we will go much deeper into this in section C3, the SIMS test may potentially lead to type 1 error rate inflation, but in general, as I'm going to explain to you later in this module, it actually behaves reasonably well, and we will talk about its properties in much more detail when I introduce SIMS-based multiple testing procedures, such as the Hochberg and Hommel procedures. And now, as an illustration, let us consider a clinical trial with uh, two or five endpoints. These are kind of two extreme cases. And we will assume that the hypothesis test statistics follow a standard multivariate normal distribution under the global null, which means that all of the hypotheses in this multiplicity problem are actually true. There is no evidence of treatment benefit with respect to any of those endpoints. And for simplicity, we will assume that the test statistics are equally correlated, which means that we have a compound symmetry correlation structure. When there are two endpoints, the common correlation coefficient ranges between negative 1 and uh, positive 1. And with five endpoints, it is actually impossible to go all the way down to negative 1 it can be shown that the lower bound for the common correlation coefficient is negative 1 over 4 or negative uh, 0.25. We will fix the family-wise error rate at a one-sided alpha of 0.025, and then we will consider multiplicity adjustments based on the bond for any procedure and SIMS test. The plot on slide 13 shows the actual family-wise error rate for the bond fronty procedure as a function of the common correlation coefficient, as a function of the true correlation among the endpoints in this multivariate problem. First of all, the actual error rate for the bond fronty procedure is exactly 0.025 when the common correlation coefficient is negative, but this is not a big consolation to us because endpoints in clinical trials are normally positively correlated. And uh, to be more precise, beneficial effects for clinical endpoints are typically positively correlated. And therefore, we're much more interested, we're much more concerned about the performance of this procedure over the range of positive correlations when the common correlation coefficient ranges between 0 and 1. And you can see here, when you focus on this interval, that the bond fronty procedure performs quite well when this common correlation coefficient is less than about perhaps 0.3. In this case, the error rate is quite close to the nominal level of 0.025, but then the error rate becomes severely deflated when the correlation coefficient is close to 1, especially with 5 endpoints, that is when you uh, take a closer look at the dashed curve, and with the solid curve corresponds to the case of 2 endpoints in this multiplicity problem. And um, this is simply a consequence of the fact that the bond Freudian procedure is overly conservative when the hypothesis test statistics are strongly positively correlated, Instead of keeping the actual 
error rate close to the nominal level, which is what you would expect of an ideal multiplicity adjustment, this procedure overcorrects and it drives the error rate down to 0 0.02 or even 0 0.015. What is the price that we have to pay for this overcorrection? The price that we have to pay for using a conservative procedure like the Bonferroni? Well, this price is power loss in our clinical trials. And um, this conclusion is presented on slide 14. If we assume once again that in our clinical trial with two or five endpoints, let's assume that it is powered at 80% before a multiplicity adjustment. The plot shows that after the bond for any adjustment, power will drop by a few percentage points if the common correlation coefficient is less than 0.5, but the amount of power loss increases dramatically as the correlation coefficient increases and then ultimately it approaches 1. And we should expect more power loss as the number of endpoints or tests uh, in general increases. This power loss directly translates in a lower probability of success in our clinical trials, a lower probability of reaching the market. This is the price a sponsor of a clinical trial pays for using an inefficient, overly conservative multiplicity adjustment. What is interesting is that when we switched to the SIMES global test and studied the relationship between the type 1 error rate and the true correlation coefficient in this problem, we see a completely different pattern, a completely different picture. As before, the actual type 1 error rate is exactly 0.025 when the common correlation coefficient is negative, but it also stays very close to the nominal level of 0.025 when the correlation coefficient is positive. The SIMES test does a very good job of adjusting the error rate without overcorrection when the correlation coefficient is less than perhaps 0.4 or 0.5 and also when it is around 1. The worst case scenario for the SIMES test is much less problematic compared to the Bonferroni procedure. The error rate curve does not go all the way down, but as you can see on the slide, it nicely rebounds and then it, then it returns to the nominal level when the common correlation coefficient approaches 1. And since the SIMES test is not guilty of overcorrection, so to speak, it should not be surprising that the power curves for the SIMES adjustment look much more attractive compared to the Bonferroni procedure. With two endpoints, for example, we see a little bit of power loss, just a few percentage points, and when the correlation coefficient is very strong, which is extremely unusual in clinical trials, there is obviously more loss with five endpoints but this loss is an order of magnitude smaller compared to the bond for any case. And this is the reason why we will spend a fair amount of time discussing science-based multiple testing procedures, such as the Hogberg and Hommel later in this module. Section C2, closure principle. Having defined two basic multiplicity adjustment methods, the Bonferroni procedure and the SIMES global test, we are now ready to begin building multiple testing procedures, and I should say efficient multiple testing procedures. To accomplish this, we will need the closure principle, which will be discussed in this section. This principle has served as the main tool for constructing powerful procedures known as closed testing procedures over the past 30 years. In fact, it is known that any single step or stepwise procedure based on p-values can be formulated as a closed testing procedure and as a result, we can always construct a closed testing procedure 
which is at least as powerful or perhaps more powerful than any single step or a stepwise procedure. To show how the closure principle is used in clinical trial applications to construct powerful stepwise procedures, we will use example 1, which is based on the prostate cancer trial. And as you remember from module A, when we introduced this example, there are two null hypotheses of interest in this clinical trial. The first one is based on the overall survival endpoint, and the second one is based on the radiographic progression, progression-free survival. We can formulate those hypotheses in terms of the underlying treatment differences that are denoted by a delta 1 and delta 2, and those deltas represent the true treatment differences based on the log hazard ratios for those two endpoints. We're going to assume for the sake of illustration that we have computed the one-sided p-values for those two endpoints. Those p-values are shown on the slide. The p-value for the overall analysis endpoint is 0 0.0102 and the p-value for, for the radiographic progression-free survival endpoint is 0 0.0181. Our goal here is to build a procedure, a multiple testing procedure, for examining the two null hypotheses, H1 and H2. It will be a closed testing procedure, and it will control the family-wise error rate at a pre-specified alpha level. In this case, it would be most appropriate to use a one-sided alpha of 0.025. And on the next several slides, I will walk you through the process of constructing a closed testing procedure in this multiplicity problem. This is a process that we go through to set up a closed testing procedure for the two null hypotheses tested in the prostate cancer trial. And by the way, I say a, a closed testing procedure because we can use this general recipe to build multiple procedures. The algorithm may look a bit complicated at first glance. I would like to point out that I will show you that in most cases, full-blown complex closed testing procedures based on this algorithm actually have a simpler attractive stepwise form, but in the general case, we have to go through the following steps. Step number one, we need to define the closed family of hypotheses, which includes all intersections of H1 and H2. There will be three intersections, and those include, as you see on the slide, H1, H2, these are the original hypotheses, and then the intersection between H1 and H2. That was step number one. Step number two, establish implication relationships. In this particular case, we say that the intersection between H1 and H2 implies H1, and it also implies H2, simply because those two um, null hypotheses are included in the intersection. Step number three, we need to define local tests, alpha-level local tests for the hypotheses included in the closed family, which once again includes H1, H2, and the intersection between H1 and H2. And uh, I say, I use the word local here to distinguish between the test for each intersection, which includes, for example, H1, and the actual test for the underlying null hypothesis H1 used by the closed testing procedure. These are two different things, and we'll take a closer look at the, this important distinction on the next slide. But finally, step four. This step defines actual decision rules for each null hypothesis. The closed testing procedure rejects a null hypothesis, for example, H1, if all intersection hypotheses implying this particular hypothesis are rejected by their local tests. So once again, as I said a minute ago, this was a very general framework for building closed testing procedures. And now we're going to take a look at the uh, applications of this general principle to example one. What I presented on slide 20 
all four steps of the process of setting up a general closed testing procedure. All that information is actually summarized visually in this simple diagram. This nice diagram provides a visual su summary of the algorithm. It shows, first of all, the three intersections in the closed family. They are represented by the orange boxes. They include at the bottom H1 and H2. These are the original null hypothesis. And at the top of this diagram, we see a larger box uh, that represents the intersection between H1 and H2. All we need to do now is to define local tests for each one of those intersections, for each one of those orange boxes. And then the decision rule for H1 will look like this. First, the local test for the intersection needs to be significant, which means that the intersection of H1 and H2 must be rejected. And then the local test for H1 needs to be significant. And now we say that the null hypothesis H1 is rejected by the closed testing procedure. It's a little bit easier to follow compared to the four-step algorithm that we defined on slide 20, but it's still a little too abstract. And therefore, I think the time has come for us to take a look at a concrete example. Slide 22 shows the same diagram as on slide 21, but now we have defined the tests, the local tests for each intersection included in this closed family. And those tests, I would like to clarify, are based on the Bonferroni procedure. And this means that we're building a Bonferroni-based closed testing procedure. Let us first begin with the individual null hypothesis H1 and H2 that are represented by the smaller orange boxes shown at the bottom of the slide. If we take a look at each one of those two boxes, we realize that there's only one hypothesis within each box. And therefore, to define a local test, we can do that simply based on the marginal p-values. For example, the local test for H1, as you see on the slide, is based on p1. This hypothesis will be rejected if p1 is less than or equal to alpha. There is no adjustment for multiplicity within each one of those two boxes, simply because we're looking at a single hypothesis at a time. And the same principle, of course, applies to H2, the other original null hypothesis. But if we now uh, move up to the large box at the top of this diagram that corresponds to the intersection between H1 and H2, we now are dealing with two null hypotheses. And therefore, we need to apply an appropriate multiplicity adjustment within that box. Since we said that we would be using the Bonferroni procedure for this intersection, that means that the intersection between H1 and H2 will be rejected by its local test if a Bonferroni based alpha levels are applied, which means that P1 should be less than or equal to alpha over 2, or P2 is less than or equal to alpha over 2. The reason we divide alpha by 2 is because there are two hypotheses within this box. Uh, so you can see here that we have defined the local tests for all intersections within the closed family for all boxes in this diagram. And we can now apply the four-step algorithm to construct the resulting bond for any based closed testing procedure. But before I explain to you how this bond for any based closed testing procedure actually works, let me say a few words about the most important property of any closed testing procedure. By the closure principle, any closed testing procedure in general controls the family-wise error rate in the strong sense at the alpha level, which was the predefined alpha level applied within each box, within each intersection hypothesis. It's a fundamental property which explains why closed testing procedures have attracted so much attention in uh, clinical trial applications and other applications in general. The power of the closure principle comes from the fact that controlling the error rate for each intersection or within one of those, each one of those orange box in the closed family translates directly into global error rate control. 
which means that the error rate is going to be controlled over the entire family of null hypotheses. We have discussed the most important property of all closed testing procedures, that they control the family-wise error rate in a strong sense. And now I'm ready to introduce another extremely important property. Even though in general, when we set up closed testing procedures, we need to go through the four-step algorithm we defined on slide 20. The actual application of many closed testing procedures in clinical trials is much more straightforward. Instead of a procedure which depends on checking the local tests for all intersections in the closed family, and we know that the number of all intersections is going to grow exponentially. Instead of doing that, we normally have a very attractive stepwise procedure of the type that we introduced in module B. For example, a stepwise procedure with a pre-specified testing sequence or a data-driven testing sequence. The second property greatly simplifies the implementation of most closed testing procedures in clinical trials, and it also facilitates communication of the resulting decision rules and the outcomes to non-statisticians, which is very important in the design and analysis of clinical trials with multiple objectives. To help illustrate this point, let's take a closer look at the bond fournier based closed testing procedure we defined on slide 22. This procedure is in fact equivalent to a stepwise procedure with a data-driven testing sequence known as the Holm procedure. And to define the decision rules for this stepwise procedure, we need to first define the ordered p-values using this parenthetical notation. As you see at the top of the slide, p1 is the smaller p-value and p2 in this case is the larger p-value. And the same parenthetical notation is used to denote the hypotheses that correspond to the smaller p-value and to the larger p-value. The whole procedure, based on the closure principle, begins with the hypothesis that corresponds to the smaller p-value, and this hypothesis is rejected, as you see in the slide, if that smaller p-value is less than or equal to alpha over 2. And if this condition is satisfied, we can then step down and take a look at the next hypothesis in this data-driven sequence, which would be the hypothesis that corresponds to the larger p-value. That p-value will be compared to the unadjusted alpha level. And specifically, the hypothesis that corresponds to the larger p-value will be rejected if the larger p-value is less than or equal to alpha, and the first hypothesis in the sequence is also rejected. As you can see, it's a simple set of decision rules, and if we had, say, five null hypotheses, we would go through them sequentially, applying the same general principles, and the testing sequence would be data-driven. We would begin again with the smallest p-value in that sequence, and we would just uh, proceed all the way down to the largest p-value. The plot on slide 25 provides a visual summary of the decision rules that we defined on slide 24. As before, we have two null hypotheses and two p-values, and those p-values are represented again using orange dots. As you can see that the null hypotheses on the horizontal axis in this plot are ordered in terms of the p-values. We'll always begin with the hypothesis that corresponds to the smaller of the two p-values. And the uh, significance threshold for that smaller p-value is represented by the uh, dotted line, and it's drawn at alpha over 2. That's the significance level that should be applied to the smaller of the two p-values. In this particular case, the hypothesis is clearly rejected because the orange dot is below the threshold drawn at alpha over 2. Therefore, we can reject this null hypothesis with the Holm procedure and then continue to the next one. That second hypothesis will be tested at the full alpha level. Once again, the orange dot is below the threshold, which is drawn at alpha, 
and this shows immediately that the Holm procedure rejects both null hypothesis and with the bond for any procedure you can check easily that only one of the two hypotheses is rejected and this particular application of the closure principle shows the power that comes with closed testing procedures. We use the Bonferroni procedure to construct a full-blown closed testing procedure, which is known as the Holm procedure, and that resulting closed testing procedure ended up being more powerful, more efficient as a multiplicity adjustment compared to the original Bonferroni. We're now ready to uh, go over a summary for section C2. And the summary begins with uh, that most important property of all closed testing procedures. Closed testing procedures, as we know now, control the family-wise error rate in the strong sense. And this is why we love them, we use them so much in clinical trials. Secondly, we have built a bond for any based closed testing procedure to show that the closure principle enables us to build powerful multiple testing procedures. Closed testing procedures, that was the most important conclusion that we drew on slide uh, 25, was that closed testing procedures are more powerful than the procedures that they are derived from. The bond for any base closed testing procedure provides actually a uniform power advantage over the basic bond for any procedure. This closed testing procedure always rejects as many null hypotheses as the bond for any but can potentially reject more null hypothesis, which results, as I said, in uniform power gain compared to the basic bond for any. Section C3, stepwise procedures with a data-driven testing sequence. We have spent a fair amount of time setting the stage, but now we are finally ready to begin defining popular multiple testing procedures. We're ready to discuss their properties, their use, their applications in clinical trials, and their software implementation. In fact, in this section, which is the last section of Module C, and then in Module D, and then in all of Module E, we will talk only about multiple testing procedures. The only exception will be a Module F, in which we will talk about simultaneous confidence intervals associated with commonly used multiple testing procedures. And then in the final module, module G, we will take a closer look at power and sample size calculations in clinical trials with multiple objectives. So uh, this, fine, this slide defines the general setting we're going to assume from now on. Suppose that we have a clinical trial with M objectives, M clinical objectives, and there's a null hypothesis of no effect that corresponds to each one of those objectives. The trial sponsor would like to find out more about available multiplicity adjustment options that guarantee strong error rate control for this family of M null hypothesis, and that control is to be provided at a predefined alpha. For example, a one-sided alpha of 0.025. In addition, the sponsor would like to find the most appropriate, efficient multiple testing procedure for this multiplicity problem. As we said in module B, we first need to understand what the distributional and logical relationships among the null hypotheses are. And in this case, when we focus on distributional relationships, two options will be considered in this module. First, we will discuss non-parametric procedures, specifically the Holm procedure. And this procedure is to be considered if we don't know anything about the joint distribution of the hypothesis test statistics, because as we know, procedures in the class of non-parametric procedures make no assumptions about the joint distribution. Non-parametric procedures are derived from the bond ferroni procedure that we introduced earlier in section C1. Secondly, with uh, semi-parametric procedures, for example, the Hochberg and the Hommel, we make flexible distributional assumptions. For example, we say that the joint distribution of the hypothesis test statistics is partially specified, which means that 
Some of its parameters, such as pairwise correlations among the test statistics, may be unknown. Semi-parametric procedures are derived from the SIMES global test, also using the closure principle. And the last case, when the joint distribution of the hypothesis test statistics is fully specified, parametric procedures need to be applied, and this case will be considered in module E. Beginning with logical relationships, in this section we assume that there is no prior information that can be used to arrange the null hypothesis from, say, the most important hypothesis to the least important hypothesis. Thus, we will restrict our attention to stepwise procedures with a data-driven testing sequence, which means that the order in which the hypothesis will be tested will be determined, will be driven by the data. And there are two classes of stepwise procedures with a data-driven testing sequence that will be defined on the next two slides. The first one is a class of step-down procedures. Example would be the Holm procedure. And secondly, a class of step-up procedures. That includes, for example, the Hochberg and Hommel procedures. We will begin with step-down procedures. If the ordered p-values are defined as shown here on the slide at the bottom of the, of the graph, from the smallest to the largest, and these are the associated null hypotheses, a step-down procedure begins with the smallest of the most significant p-value. And if this p-value is less than a certain pre-specified threshold, a certain pre-specified significance level, the hypothesis is rejected and the step-down procedure is going to continue to the second hypothesis in the sequence as demonstrated by this large blue arrow. But if the first p-value in this data-driven sequence is not significant enough, if it cannot be, if the associated hypothesis cannot be rejected, the step-down procedure would stop and all null hypothesis would actually be accepted. So in general, step-down procedures are performed in a sequentially rejective fashion until either a certain null hypothesis is accepted or sometimes testing may stop because the procedure reaches the end of the sequence, in which case all null hypotheses will be rejected. Step-up procedures are an exact mirror image of step-down procedures that were defined on slide 30. In this case, testing begins with the largest p-value and will go all the way down to the smallest p-value, as demonstrated by this arrow. And the decision rules are also reversed compared to step-down procedures. For example, if the largest p-value is less than the pre-specified threshold, all null hypotheses will be rejected. Otherwise, that is, if the largest p-value turns out to be non-significant, testing does not stop. A step-up procedure simply accepts the first null hypothesis in the sequence, and it's going to proceed to the next hypothesis in this sequence. This testing algorithm is then applied to all null hypotheses until the procedure reaches the end of the sequence, which will be the hypothesis that corresponds to the smallest p-value. Holm procedure. The Bonferrini-based closed testing procedure that we defined a few minutes ago, also known as the Holm procedure, is an example of a step-down procedure. What we see on the slide is the underlying step-down testing algorithm for an arbitrary number of hypotheses. We've already defined the general step-down algorithm, and we've also shown how the Holm procedure works in the prostate cancer trial example. So here I'm going to point out several key features of the general Holm procedure. First of all, the Holm procedure begins with the smallest p-value, and it uses the same threshold as the Bonferrini procedure, which is the alpha divided by the number of hypotheses, which is m in this case. If the smallest p-value is significant at this level, we're going to continue to the next step, and the remaining hypothesis will be tested at a higher significance level. The significance level is not alpha over m anymore. In general, it will be alpha over m plus 
minus i plus 1, where i indicates the steps that we're at. And this is how the whole procedure gains a power advantage over the basic Bonferroni. Finally, if the whole procedure makes it to the very last step, and this happens only if all preceding hypotheses are rejected, the last hypothesis will be tested at the full alpha level. Again, this is the power of the closure principle. Starting with the Bonferroni procedure, we can construct a procedure which uses uniformly higher significance levels for all of the hypotheses. This is a uh, summary of main properties of the Holm procedure. If I can start with the second point, the Holm procedure is uniformly more powerful than the Bonferroni procedure. The Holm procedure, as we said, rejects all null hypotheses rejected by the Bonferroni and can potentially reject more null hypotheses. We talked about this in the context of the prostate cancer trial example. But then you may ask, do we have to pay any price for this uniform power gain? If power is uniformly greater compared to the bond for any procedure, is it possible that perhaps the family-wise error rate can be inflated? The answer to this important question is no. The whole procedure was derived from the basic, basic bond for only, and therefore it controls the family-wise error rate for any joint distribution of test statistics, just like the bond for any procedure does. Again, this is the beauty and power of the closure principle. An efficient procedure can be enhanced without compromising error rate control. I have introduced the decision rules used by the Bonferroni and Holm procedures. And the next topic on our list, and it's actually a very natural next step, is the presentation of multiplicity adjusted inferences. There are essentially three ways of performing inferences in multiplicity problems. The idea behind any multiplicity adjustment, as we've said several times before, is that we modify decision rules for the individual null hypothesis. We accomplish this by adjusting the significance levels, or by adjusting the p-values, or adjusting the confidence limits. These are the three ways of performing or presenting multiplicity adjustments. Here, I will concentrate only on adjusted significance levels and adjusted p-values. Adjusted or simultaneous confidence limits will be discussed in module E. Now, since the decision rules are modified to make it more difficult to declare significance for the individual tests, and that's what multiplicity adjustments are all about, Significance levels for the individual hypothesis are adjusted downward and p-values are adjusted upward. The decision rules based on the adjusted significance levels and adjusted p-values are shown on the slide. The null hypothesis is HI is rejected if the original p-value is less than the adjusted significance level or alternatively, if the adjusted p-value is less than or equal to the original alpha level. So which adjustment method should we use? It is generally more convenient to work with adjusted p-values compared to adjusted significance levels, and that's mostly because adjusted p-values can be used with any alpha level, and the adjusted alpha levels do not need to be pre-specified. And the multiplicity adjustments in most clinical trial publications are actually reported using adjusted p-values. Let's now return to the type 2 diabetes example, which is example 4, to show how to compute and interpret adjusted significance levels and adjusted p-values. This table summarizes the so-called raw or unadjusted p-values produced by each individual test, each dose compared to placebo. And as before, these are the one-sided p-values for each dose placebo comparison. For example, we can see here that the p-value uh, for the comparison between dose 1 and placebo is 0.0111. Now, if we were using adjusted alpha levels, we would simply apply the bond for any procedure 
by taking the alpha, which is 0.025, it's one-sided alpha, and we would divide it by three. The bound for an adjusted significance level for each hypothesis ends up being 0 0.0083. Using this adjusted significance level, there is evidence of a significant treatment effect only at those two, and the other p-values are not significant when the bound for any adjustment level is applied. We could also compute adjusted significance levels for the whole procedure, but the process is um, a bit more complicated here because the adjusted significance levels would be hypothesis specific, and they would also have to be computed sequentially to reflect the step-down testing algorithm that we defined a few slides back. And therefore, the whole adjusted significance levels would be more difficult to interpret. But if we want to compute adjusted p-values, the interpretation turns out to be quite straightforward. At the end of the section, we will talk about software implementation of commonly used, popular, multiple testing procedures. And I will explain how to use SAS or R to compute adjusted p-values for most popular procedures. But for now, let us just focus on the interpretation of those adjusted p-values. This table lists adjusted p-values for the Bonferroni and Holm procedures in example four. This is how multiplicity adjustments are typically presented in publications in clinical study reports. We can see here that the adjusted p-values for the Bonferroni procedure are given by 0 0.0333, then 0 0.0195, and 0 0.0879. To be able to develop decision rules based on those adjusted p-values, all we have to do is to simply compare those adjusted p-values to the predefined alpha level, which is 0 0.025, and you can easily see that only one of those adjusted p-values, specifically the adjusted p-value for H2, is less than or equal to alpha of 0 0.025. And therefore, the conclusion that we summarized here at the bottom of the slide is that the bond for any procedure rejects only H2. The same principle applies to the adjusted p-values for the Holm procedure. When we review those procedures shown in the rightmost column, all we have to do is we need to compare each one of those adjusted p-values to the alpha of 0 0.025. And you can easily see that the Holm procedure rejects H1, and it also rejects H2, but the adjusted p-value for H3 is above the alpha. And what's important to remember here is that the adjusted p-values for the Holm procedure, and once again, it's a more complex procedure, that utilizes a stepwise testing algorithm. Those p-values have already incorporated all information about this multiplicity problem and about this multiple testing procedure. And each individual p-value is once again simply compared to the 0.025 level. It can be done in any order. We don't have to worry about the underlying sequential algorithm anymore. Hommel procedure. We will now take a closer look at semi-parametric procedures derived from the SIMES global test. The Holm procedure, as you remember, is an example of a closed testing procedure derived from the Bonferroni. And the next two procedures we're going to discuss are closed testing procedures derived from the SIMES test. That includes the HOML, and then we'll take a look at the Hogwarts procedure. Both of them are quite popular in clinical trial applications, so we'll introduce them and compare them to the Holm procedure. The first science-based procedure is the HOML, and it is defined by directly applying the closure principle to the science global test, which means that within the closed family, we consider each intersection hypothesis, and then we define a local test based on the SIMES global test. The resulting closed testing procedure is a step-up procedure, but the underlying step-up algorithm is less straightforward, it is more complex compared to the algorithm used in the Holm procedure, 
as you will see on the next slide. Well, as I promised, it is a rather complex testing algorithm and two points I would like to make here are, first of all, it is a step-up algorithm that begins with the largest p-value. If the first hypothesis in the data-driven sequence is rejected, then all the hypotheses within the selected family will be rejected as well. But on the other hand, if the first hypothesis is accepted, this is not the end of the game. Testing will continue. As you can see, the algorithm is going to proceed to step two, and in general, it will actually go all the way down to the end of the sequence. And secondly, the decision rule for each hypothesis in steps two, three, and all of the other steps up to step M depend on the current p-value as well as all of the p-values that are greater than the current p-value. For example, the decision rule for the second hypothesis in the data-driven sequence depends on the second largest p-value and then also on the largest p-value. It's a very interesting property and what the HOML procedure does here is that it borrows power, so to speak, for the current hypothesis from the other hypothesis that have been examined earlier in the sequence and it helps ultimately improve power. As we will see in a few minutes, the HOMO procedure is in fact the most powerful multiple testing procedure among the procedures that will be discussed in Module C. So um, this is the algorithm that is used in the HOMO procedure and the complexity that I mentioned is not really computational complexity. In reality, this step-up algorithm is easy to implement literally using a pocket calculator. I was referring to our ability to interpret the individual steps in this algorithm. And to help us understand the step-up testing algorithm used in the HOML procedure, we're going to return to example four, type two diabetes trial example. We will consider a different set of treatment effect p-values it will be labeled scenario two, but the general structure of this table and also the notation at the bottom of the table is very similar to what uh, we have seen before. Specifically, this table lists the individual comparisons, each dose versus placebo in this type two diabetes trial. And for each of those comparisons, we see a one-sided p-value. The first one, for example, is 0.0291. And um, to be able to apply the HOML procedure, just like the HOLM procedure, we need to define the ordered p-values. Those p-values are ordered from the smallest one to the largest one uh, below this table. And in addition, based on those ordered p-values, we're going to define the ordered null hypothesis. And once again, as we've done it so many times before, we're using here this parenthetical notation to differentiate between the original p-values and the ordered p-values. Let us now try to apply the HOML procedure based on the step-up testing algorithm that was defined two slides back to this scenario number two based on the type two diabetes example. We're going to begin with the first hypothesis in the data-driven testing sequence and the decision rule is going to be formulated in terms of the largest p-value. This decision rule is shown at the bottom of the slide and we conclude here that since that largest p-value exceeds alpha, we cannot accept the associated hypothesis. However, as we said, this is not the end of the game. We're going to continue to step number two. Step two, even though, as we said, we were unable to reject the first hypothesis, we can still test the second hypothesis in this data-driven sequence and the decision rule, as you see at the bottom of the slide, right before uh, this plot, this decision rule borrows power from the first test that we defined on slide 42. This decision rule for rejecting the second hypothesis in the sequence depends on the associated p-value as well as the p-value that was examined in step number one. In this particular case, we cannot reject the uh, second hypothesis 
in the sequence because both of the p-values are above the appropriate thresholds. And finally, in step number three, this slide uh, defines the decision rule for the hypothesis that corresponds to the smallest p-value. And this decision rule, according to the concept of borrowing power, depends on all three p-values. It does look a bit complicated. You see this rule, this decision rule defined right below this plot. It depends on each uh, of the three p-values. And this is a good example of how the HOML procedure can borrow power across the uh, hypothesis in a given family. In this particular case, because the uh, second and the third conditions here are satisfied, the final decision is to reject the hypothesis that corresponds to the smallest p-value. The next science-based procedure we're going to examine is the Hogberg procedure. This multiple testing procedure also relies on a data-driven testing sequence. The Hogberg procedure, as we said, is also a semi-parametric procedure, which is uh, derived from the SIMES global test. It is derived using the closure principle. And the main, really the key difference between the Hommel and the Hogberg is that the Hogberg procedure is based on a more straightforward, um, simplified version of the SIMES global test, which results in a more straightforward step-up testing algorithm that will be defined on the next slide. This slide defines the step-up testing algorithm used in the Hogberg procedure. It is very helpful, I think, to compare the, the two step-up algorithms that are employed in the Hommel and Hogberg procedures. The first point is that both of them are, of course, based on a step-up testing algorithm. The testing in both cases begins with the largest p-value. But the first, this was the first similarity, and the first difference is that unlike the Hommel procedure, the Hogberg procedure does not borrow power across the hypothesis. If you look closer at the decision rules for each individual null hypothesis, you will notice that that each decision rule depends only on the p-value for that particular hypothesis. This makes the algorithm easier to follow, but of course the price we'll have to pay is that since we don't borrow power across the hypothesis, we're going to uh, see ultimately some power loss compared to the HOML procedure. And just by looking at decision rules defined here, we can actually predict that the Hogwarts procedure will be less powerful than the Hommel procedure. And as another quick illustration for this new step up procedure, we're going to apply to the same example, the same set of p-values that were labeled scenario two, based on the type two diabetes example. The decision rule for the first hypothesis here is exactly the same as the decision rule that was used in step one for the Hommel procedure. And the conclusion is also the same. The Hogberg procedure cannot reject the first null hypothesis in the sequence, and that's the hypothesis that corresponds to the largest p-value because the condition is not satisfied. The associated p-value is above the alpha threshold. Step two on this slide, slide 49, shows the difference between the two step up procedures. Decision rule for this ordered hypothesis depends only on the current p-value, as you can see when you take a look at the rule shown below the plot. And that's the rule that is utilized by the Hogwarts procedure. However, despite the differences between the two decision rules used by the Hogberg and the Hommel, the conclusion that we draw here is exactly the same that we drew in step two for the Hommel procedure. The second ordered hypothesis cannot be rejected by the Hogberg. And the last step is step three. Here's another example of the differences between the Hogberg and Hommel procedures. As I explained a couple of slides back, the price we have to pay for failing to borrow power and utilizing all of the available p-values 
in this particular case is that the last hypothesis in the sequence is not rejected by the Hogberg because specifically as you can see at the bottom of the slide the smallest p-value is not below the appropriate threshold and the threshold for the Hogberg procedure is alpha over 3 and if you remember when we discussed uh, the application of the Hommel procedure to the same set of p-values, the conclusion in step 3 was that the Hommel procedure actually rejected the, small, the, the hypothesis corresponding to the smallest p-value. So in this particular case, the Hommel procedure clearly looks more attractive. This slide provides a summary of uh, key properties of the two step-up procedures. First of all, uh, the first property is that um, more of an interesting or even curious fact that both Hommel and Hogberg procedures reject all null hypotheses in a multiplicity problem in a clinical trial if all the raw or unadjusted p-values are less than or equal to alpha. It makes it very easy to predict the final outcome if all p-values are uniformly very small but if, it is, if at least one p-value exceeds alpha, then we'll need to invoke those potentially complicated step-up testing algorithms to figure out which hypothesis will be rejected by those two procedures. And the second property shown here under power is much more important. This property is related to a power comparison between those two procedures. And what we need to remember here, it's a, it's a really, really important fact that help us understand the relationships among the procedures that we have discussed so far. The first fact is that the Hogberg procedure is uniformly more powerful than the Holm procedure. And secondly, the Hommel procedure is also uniformly more powerful than the Hogberg procedure. This is the property that I mentioned briefly a few minutes ago. The Hommel procedure is based on a very efficient set of decision rules that borrow power across multiple null hypotheses, and this results in a uniform power gain compared to the Hogberg procedure. Every hypothesis rejected by the Hogberg is guaranteed to be rejected by the Hommel, but in certain cases, the Hommel procedure may be able to reject additional hypotheses, just like we saw in the example based on the type 2 diabetes trial. We're not completely done with that uh, power comparison between the Hommel and Hogwarts procedures. I would like to spend a bit more time on this topic. And the reason here is that the Hogwarts procedure serves as a good example of the importance of simple decision rules or decision-making processes in biased statistical applications. The Hogwarts procedure is very popular in clinical trials despite the fact that it is known to be less powerful than the Hommel procedure. So thanks to the simplicity of the underlying testing algorithm, it is easy to explain to non-statisticians, to clinical project teams, and um, as a result of that, the Hogberg procedure remains the most popular science-based procedure used in clinical trials. However, as uh, we discussed, as I showed, the testing algorithm used in the Hommel procedure is only marginally more complex and this procedure is recommended for clinical trial applications, for clinical trials with multiple objectives because this procedure provides a uniform power improvement compared to the Hogwarts procedure. And um, it's interesting to point out by the way that the Hommel procedure, despite its popularity in clinical trials, is never explicitly mentioned in the FDA's draft guidance on multiple endpoints, but once again, I would personally recommend to apply the Hommel procedure whenever the Hogwarts procedure is considered. On slide 52, we discussed the comparison between the two step-up procedures, science-based procedures, in terms of power, and now let's talk about family-wise error rate control. It's a very important topic, of course, whenever we talk about multiplicity adjustments. First of all, there is an important difference between bond for any procedures, for example, Holm procedures, and the Symes-based procedures, such as the Hogberg and Hommel, uh, 
the decision rules for the individual hypothesis for any bond for any based procedure or any science based procedure are formulated in terms of the underlying p values but despite that the whole procedure is truly non parametric in the sense that it does not make any assumptions about the joint distribution of the hypothesis test statistics and by contrast and we've alluded to this multiple times the Hommel and Hogberg procedures are not non-parametric they're actually semi-parametric they are symes based which means that they control the family wise error rate only under additional assumptions on the joint distribution specifically the Hommel and Hogberg procedures control the family wise error rate only when this the underlying science global test controls the type one error rate and in fact there have been some publications that studied the worst case scenario for the Hommel and Hogberg procedures to understand to what extent the family wise error rate could be potentially inflated and this example is shown at the bottom of the slide very quickly if the number of comparisons is 2 that is if m is equal to 2 then in the then in the worst case scenario the family wise error rate can uh, be as high as 1.5 alpha which means that the family wise error rate can be inflated by 50% and with four comparisons or four hypotheses when m is equal to 4 the maximum amount of family wise error rate inflation is 2.1 alpha which means that the family wise error rate can be inflated by as much as 110 percent this was an interesting um, case of um, results but what i would like to clarify right now is that the worst case scenario that was discussed on slide 53 actually corresponds to a very unrealistic extreme case and we will never deal with this extreme case in real clinical trials with normally distributed test statistics and it's very common to assume multivariate normality in large phase 3 clinical trials the amount of family wise error rate inflation tends to be trivial and this is what i'm going to uh, discuss right now uh, here's a very quick example which is based on a simulation based evaluation um, of uh, potential error rate inflation associated with SIMES based procedures and this evaluation shows that the magnitude of error rate inflation in problems with negative correlations is actually quite trivial quite quite tiny for example this paper by Sarkar and Cheng published in 1997 reports the results of um, computer-based simulations uh, the authors focused on the type 1 error rate associated with the science global test in problems with 3 5 and 10 hypotheses under the assumption that the hypothesis test statistics follow a multivariate distribution and with a one-sided alpha of 0.025 which is what we normally use in phase 3 clinical trials they show that the highest error rate over a very large number of scenarios was 0 0.0254 it's only slightly larger of course than the standard significance level and that means that the error rate was inflated by less than two percent on a relative scale in the worst case scenario whenever the underlying test statistics followed a multivariate distribution in addition to those simulation based evaluations the type one error rate of the science global test and as a result the family wise error rate of semi-parametric procedures um, they've been studied in multiple publications and sufficient conditions for type one error rate control have been derived the most basic case here is the case of independent hypothesis test statistics which is of course not a realistic assumption in the context of clinical trials also the SIMES procedure controls the type one error rate when the joint distribution of the test statistics exhibits a certain type of positive dependence 
Specifically, when the joint distribution is multivariate, totally positive of, of order two. This positive dependence condition is generally somewhat difficult to define, but the good news for us when we talk about clinical trial applications that when the test statistics follow a multivariate normal distribution, this positive dependence condition is met and the semi-parametric procedures protect the family-wise error rate if all pairwise correlations are non-negative. I think the time for us has come to provide a, a quick summary of all error rate related issues for semi-parametric procedures. And um, to summarize, the type 1 error rate inflation may be a concern for the Hommel and Hogler procedures, but there are multiple scenarios in which both procedures can be validly applied in clinical trial applications. And because of that, I would encourage you to consider those two procedures as an alternative to less powerful non-parametric procedures. What you see on the slide is a list of scenarios uh, that are based on the clinical trials that are introduced in Module A, and also the specific conditions under which those semi-parametric procedures provide family-wise error rate control. Beginning with, with example one, the prostate cancer trial, the positive condition is satisfied if the two endpoints are positively correlated. This may require some additional justification to show that in reality, truly, those endpoints are positively or actually non-negatively correlated. Secondly, when we examine um, the type 2 diabetes trial, which is example 4, then it's quite easy to show that the positive dependence condition is satisfied since the treatment arms are compared to a common control because those comparisons those con placebo comparisons share a common control this fact induces positive correlations and therefore the positive condition is known to be satisfied and in example five the positive dependence condition is also satisfied because the subpopulation of interest in this non-small cell lung cancer trial is a subset of the overall population, which is something that again induces positive correlation between the appropriate, the associated test statistics. And um, of course, the conditions under which the Hogberg procedure and also the Hommel procedure protect the family-wise error rate are discussed in the FDA's guidance on multiple endpoints. Uh, you'll find this discussion in section four and um, as I said earlier, this guidance focuses on the Hogberg procedures and never mentions for some reason the Hommel procedure, even though the Hommel is clearly a more efficient procedure, something that I would recommend in clinical trial applications. The guidance makes the following comment. The Hogberg procedure is known to provide adequate overall alpha control for independent endpoint tests and also for two positively correlated dependent tests with standard test statistics. And then it lists the specific distributions uh, that uh, provide alpha control. And it's also a valid test procedure when certain conditions are met. Various simulation experiments for the general case, for example, for more than two endpoints with unequal correlation structures, indicate that the Hogwarts procedure usually will, but is not guaranteed to, control the overall type 1 error rate for positively correlated endpoints, but fails to do so for some negatively correlated endpoints. This longer discussion concludes with the statement that you see on the slide. It is stated here that beyond the aforementioned cases, when the Hogberg procedure is known to be valid, its use is generally not recommended for the primary comparisons of confirmatory clinical trials unless it can be shown that adequate control of type 1 error rate is provided. And I would say that um, given the key properties of the semi-parametric procedure, once again, the Hommel and Hogberg procedures that we have discussed, I find the statement included in the FDA's draft guidance to be overly cautious. It is true, and we've said it multiple times, that the Hommel and Hogberg procedures may not be valid in certain multiplicity problems.
but at the same time we have just shown that those two procedures as well as other procedures derived from the SIMES test are valid multiple testing procedures that in fact protect the family-wise error rate under very broad set of assumptions and I would like to add that they have been successfully used successfully applied to address multiplicity problems in numerous confirmatory phase 3 trials. Now let us do a quick exercise. We're going to consider a large clinical trial that was conducted to study the effect of an experimental therapy on a single cardiovascular primary endpoint and then an interim analysis was performed to examine the efficacy and safety properties of this new treatment and the trial sponsor discovered that this treatment had a beneficial effect on another important outcome variable. So based on the interim findings, this outcome variable was added as a, another primary endpoint. And since the trial now has two endpoints, two primary endpoints, the trial sponsor, of course, um, is, is required to propose a strategy to address multiplicity, to protect the overall error rate in this trial. The strategy was described in a proposal that was to be submitted to a regulatory agency and the proposal was reviewed and several errors were found. What we see on the slide is a summary of key points from the proposal and there are several errors in this proposal. So let's see if you can identify those errors. I will let you think about this exercise in your spare time and we'll take a look at the following diagram that provides several helpful hints. This diagram is shown on slide 61. This slide displays the relationship among the four multiple testing procedures that uh, we have discussed, we have introduced in this module. And I'd like to point out that there is no reference to the SIMES test because once again, this is not a multiple testing procedure, it's just a global test. These procedures are arranged in the order of increasing power the procedures on the right-hand sides are uniformly more powerful than the procedures on the left-hand side. And this is a good visual summary of a very important conclusion. In the class of p-value based procedures, there are four procedures and all of them are used in clinical trials, despite the fact that one of the procedures, the HOML, is always better than the others. So when you choose, when you're in the process of choosing a multiple testing procedure for a clinical trial with multiple objectives, I would like you to think about this diagram to keep it in mind. Please use this diagram as a guideline. It will remind you that unless there are concerns about family-wise error rate control for science based procedures, you should always consider the HOML procedure. If you have to restrict your attention to Bonferroni based procedures, that is non parametric procedures, uh, then the home procedure should definitely be the procedure of choice rather than the basic Bonferroni because it leads to a uniform power advantage over the basic Bonferroni procedure. With the methodological foundation for two classes of multiple testing procedures in place, I am referring here to non-parametric and semi-parametric procedures. We are now ready to introduce an important topic of software implementation. How do we perform multiplicity adjustments based on the Bonferroni, Holm, Hogberg and Hommel procedures? These procedures can be implemented using SAS software as well as open source R software. And I would like to mention again that the code shown on the next 10 slides, as well as the code that will be included in the software implementation sections in the other modules, can be downloaded from the online courses web page. Please look for supplemental material at the top of this page. Let's begin with the software implementation options in SAS. The available options include SAS procedures mainly PROC-MOL test, 
Park mild test supports a number of popular non-parametric as well as semi-parametric procedures, mostly those procedures that we introduced in this module. But I would like to say that it was originally designed to implement resampling-based adjustments. We briefly touched upon resampling-based procedures in module B, mainly to point out that they are not used in confirmatory phase 3 clinical trials due to the fact that they provide approximate error rate control. And in addition to that, several SAS macros developed by clinical trial statisticians, including myself, are available. As I will explain in a minute, the macros tend to be more flexible they support more features and they are generally more useful compared to SAS procedures as far as multiplicity adjustments are concerned. Popular multiple testing procedures can also be implemented using our software. There are several packages available on the CRAN website and CRAN here stands for the Comprehensive R Archive Network. This includes the mild comp package, for example. This particular package supports a variety of multiple testing procedures that are parametric in nature, and they rely on linear and various other models, including semi-parametric models. I would also like to mention the Mediana package. This powerful R package was introduced in 2015 to support general simulation-based power and sample size calculations in late-stage clinical trials. I will provide a detailed description of this package in Module G, but if we are interested primarily in implementing commonly used multiple testing procedures, we will only need one function in this package. It is the function that you see on the slide. It's the adjust p-values function which supports a large number of popular procedures, including non-parametric, semi-parametric, and fully parametric procedures. We're going to refer to example 4 based on the type 2 diabetes trial, and we'll use the following set of p-values, one-sided p-values as before, that correspond to the individual dose placebo comparisons in this clinical trial. Suppose that we would like to implement a multiplicity adjustment based on the Holm procedure in SAS, which means that we are interested in computing multiplicity adjusted p values based on this procedure for the three individual null hypotheses in example 4. To accomplish this, we will use first proc mult test, and then I will show you how to use a macro that I wrote a few years ago known as the PVAL PROC macro. First, we will need to create a data set with the raw or unadjusted p-values for the three hypotheses. This data set also specifies the hypothesis weights that quantify their relative importance within this clinical trial. For now, we will assume for simplicity that the hypotheses are equally important, they're equally weighted, and since there are three hypotheses, the weight variable in this data set is set to one third. With PROC mult test, we need to pass the data set that we set up on slide 66 to the SAS procedure, and we specify Holm as a keyword in PROC mult test. This means that the multiplicity adjusted p values will be computed using the Holm procedure. And I would like to mention that other available options include the Bonferroni, Hogberg, and Homola procedures, and the corresponding keywords are shown below the mult test, PROC mult test code. An important feature of PROC mult test is that it does not support hypothesis specific weights. This procedure assumes that the hypotheses in any multiplicity problem are equally important. And in fact, when we define the weight variable in the X4 data set on slide 66, this weight variable will be ignored by PROC mult test. Yes, it's a limitation for practical applications of this procedure, and we will need to switch to a custom macro, for example, the PVAL PROC macro that I'm going to introduce in a minute. 
But first, let us quickly review the output produced by PROC MALT test. This output shows us the test IDs 1, 2, 3. These are the indices of the corresponding null hypotheses in the type 2 diabetes trial. We see a column that shows the raw p values. And on the right hand side, we see a column with the multiplicity adjusted p values based on the whole procedure. And it's interesting to note that the Holm procedure is referred within PROC MALT test as the step down bond for any procedure, as you see on the slide, which is actually true because the Holm procedure relies on a step down testing algorithm and it is indeed derived from the bond for any procedure. And to interpret those multiplicity adjusted p values, as we discussed earlier in this module, the decision rules for the individual hypothesis in this trial are easily derived based on those adjusted p-values. The decision rules are actually very straightforward. All we need to do now is to select an alpha level and compare each adjusted p-value to this level. With a one-sided alpha of 0.025, we see immediately that the Holm procedure rejects the first two null hypotheses in this trial, but it cannot reject the last, the third hypothesis, because the adjusted p-value is greater than 0.025. So the conclusion in this clinical trial is that with the home based multiplicity adjustment, there's evidence of a statistically significant effect at doses 1 and 2, but not at dose 3. This slide shows how multiplicity adjusted p-values can be computed using the p-val proc macro. The macro's name, as you can guess, indicates that it supports general p-value based multiple testing procedures. It's a broad class of procedures that includes both non-parametric and semi-parametric procedures. This macro has two parameters. The in parameter specifies the name of the data set with hypothesis weights and raw p-values. And the out parameter specifies the name of the data set with adjusted p-values. Now we need to run this macro and then print out the resulting adjusted p-values. The output of this macro is not shown on the slide because it is exactly the same as the set of multiplicity adjusted p-values that was produced by PROCMALT test. I presented that set of adjusted p-values on slide 68. And to summarize the main advantage of using this macro compared to PROCMALT test in SAS is that this macro supports multiplicity adjustments in general settings with potentially unequally weighted null hypothesis. We will see how it can be accomplished on the next slide. We're going to return to example one to discuss the implementation of multiple testing procedures in clinical trials with unequally weighted objectives, or in other words, unequally weighted null hypothesis. These weights typically reflect the relevant importance of the objectives. If you remember in example one, multiplicity was induced by the analysis of two primary endpoints. Endpoint one was based on overall survival. Endpoint two was based on radiographic progression-free survival. And the weights that are predefined and assigned to those individual endpoints are shown below. The weight for the first endpoint is 0.8 and the weight for the second endpoint is 0.2. And I would like to mention that in oncology trials with two co-primary endpoints, such as overall survival and progression-free survival, we typically see much more extreme sets of weights. For example, in the enzalutamide trial that serves as the main inspiration, so to speak, for this example, the primary endpoints were analyzed as follows. The overall two-sided type 1 error rate of 0.05 was split between overall survival and radiographic progression-free survival with an error rate of 0.001 allocated to radiographic progression-free survival 
and an error rate of 0 0.049 allocated to overall survival. So this means that only 2% of the overall error rate was allocated to PFS and the remaining 98% was allocated to the overall survival test. Slide 71 shows the code to implement a weighted version of the Holm procedure in SAS using the PVL proc macro. As before, we first need to specify a data set. It is called EX1. This data set includes the raw p values for the endpoint tests and the predefined weights. The weights are given by 0.8 and 0.2. Again, this data set is then passed to the PVL proc macro. This macro generates an output data set, a adjusted p, ADJP, and this data set contains the whole adjusted p values. This slide shows the output, the resulting home adjusted p-values produced by this macro. And it is clear that with a one-sided alpha of 0.0 to 5, the treatment effect on both endpoints is significant since both adjusted p-values are less than 0.0 to 5. The next step for us will be to go over the available options for implementing popular non-parametric and semi-parametric procedures in R. As I said, we're going to take advantage of the Mediana package. For now, we will focus on a single function within this package. It's the adjusted p-values function, which can be used to compute multiplicity adjusted p-values for commonly used non-parametric and semi-parametric procedures. And in addition, it also supports popular parametric multiple testing procedures. We will talk about this later in this online course. Right now, I will show you very quickly how to use this function to implement the whole procedure in a multiplicity problem with unequally weighted null hypothesis based on example one. This function, the adjusted p-values function, requires two pre-specified objects that are defined in the following two arguments. First, raw p is the vector of raw p values. In this particular case, the p values are given by 0 0.0102 and 0 0.0181. Secondly, the second argument proc defines the multiple testing procedure that will be applied. This parameter is set to Holm adjust, and here Holm adjust is the name of the built-in function within the Mediana package that implements the Holm procedure. And we use the suffix adj, or adjust, to indicate that this is a function that performs a multiplicity adjustment. In addition to this, there's also an optional parameter called par. This optional parameter defines other parameters. This could be actually a list of several parameters that may be required by the selected multiple testing procedure. For example, we assume in this particular case that the hypothesis associated with the overall survival and radiographic progression-free survival endpoints are not equally weighted, and the hypothesis weights can be specified using the weight parameter. Weight is set to a vector of 0.8 and 0.2, and then this parameter is passed to the adjust p-values function using the par parameter, as you can see on the slide. If the vector of weights is not specified, I would like to point out that the adjusted p-values function will simply use the default set of hypothesis weights. And with this default, the hypothesis will be equally weighted. The output of this R function is shown on the slide. We see here a vector, a set of multiplicity adjusted p-values. They are equal to 0 0.0128 and 0 0.0181. These adjusted p-values are, of course, equal to the adjusted p-values that were that are presented on slide 72. I would like to very quickly reiterate that the Mediana package supports a large number of popular multiple testing procedures. For example, 
adjusted p-values based on the von froni hogberg or Hamel procedures can be easily computed. All you have to do is to replace the function that implements the Holm procedure, which is Holm adjust, with an appropriate function such as bond froni adjust or any other that you see at the bottom of the slide. And for this reason, we will use this function again and again in modules D and E. But in addition to that, this package was designed to be very flexible and easy to expand. And therefore, any user can write a function of their own to implement perhaps a novel multiple testing procedure that is not currently supported by the Mediana package. And for more information about writing custom functions of this kind, please see the package's online manual. You will find the link to this manual in module G.